This is Space Time Series 22, Episode 3, for broadcast on the 9th of January 2019. Coming up on Space Time, New Horizons reveals a totally new kind of world. Our Milky Way heading for a collision with a large Magellanic Cloud galaxy. And China lands a rover on the far side of the moon. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. NASA's New Horizons spacecraft has successfully completed its close encounter with Ultima Thule, which at 6.6 billion kilometres is the most distant world ever explored. The first images are showing the space rock to be an entirely new kind of world. New Horizons completed the furthest flyby in history on New Year's Day, coming within 3,540 kilometres of the 31 kilometre long Kuiper Belt object, zooming past at well over 51,000 kilometres an hour. The encounter has confirmed that Ultima Thule is a contact binary, comprising two bodies held together gravitationally. Its remarkable appearance, unlike anything ever seen before, is helping to illuminate the sorts of processes which helped build our solar system's planets 4.6 billion years ago. Officially catalogued as 2014 MU69, Ultima Thule is one of tens of thousands of frozen worlds, comets and icy debris which circle the sun out beyond the orbit of Neptune in a dark, little understood region of the solar system called the Kuiper Belt. Ultima Thule is an ancient traditional name used to describe the most distant land known, a place beyond the borders of the known world. To the ancient Greeks and Romans, it was the name often used to refer to Iceland or Greenland, with the remote Orkney and Shetland Islands also often referred to as Ultima Thule in medieval times. New Horizons principal investigator Alan Stern from the Southwest Research Institute in Boulder, Colorado, says the flyby is an historic achievement. He says never before has any spacecraft team tracked down such a small body at such a high speed and so far away in the abyss of space. In the process, Stern says New Horizons has set a new bar for state-of-the-art spacecraft navigation. There are seven scientific instruments aboard New Horizons. These include two plasma instruments, a radio experiment, a UV spectrometer, and two different kinds of high-resolution camera systems, recording images, spectra, and chemical composition of this distant world. The first colour images of Ultima Thule, taken at a distance of 137,000 kilometres, highlighted this distant world's reddish surface, the same colour as other worlds in the Kuiper Belt. The new images, taken from around 27,000 kilometres on approach, have revealed Ultima Thule to be two connected spheres. Stern and colleagues have named the larger 19-kilometre wide sphere as Ultima and the smaller 14-kilometre diameter sphere Thule. They say the two spheres likely merged soon after the solar system formed, colliding no faster than two cars in a fender bender. Initial data analysis has found no evidence of rings or satellites larger than a kilometre in diameter orbiting Ultima Thule. There's also no evidence of an atmosphere around this deep frozen world. New Horizons Geology and Geophysics team lead Jeff Moore describes New Horizons as a time machine taking science back to the birth of the solar system. He says it's providing a physical representation of the beginning of planetary formation, frozen in time. Moore says studying Ultima Thule is helping scientists understand how planets form. The CSIRO's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra says signals from New Horizons travelling at the speed of light are taking over six hours to reach NASA mission control back on Earth. However, data transmissions are being paused for a week or so as the spacecraft passes behind the sun as seen from Earth. Nagel says when transmissions resume, it'll mark the start of a 20-month long download session for the spacecraft's remaining scientific treasures. These will include much higher resolution images, allowing scientists to write new chapters in the story of Ultima Thule and the solar system. Well, the mission, of course, uh, was very pleased that they got a successful signal back from New Horizons post this encounter with Ultima Thule. And now, of course, all the information that is being streamed back from the spacecraft 
with those first images and all sorts of other information coming from the instruments on board the spacecraft. Got a bit of a problem coming up, haven't you? Because from our point of view here on Earth, Ultimate Tule is almost on the other side of the sun right now. So the sun's going to be in the way between us and New Horizons. Yes, so for uh, several days, the spacecraft from our point of view will actually start passing behind the sun and we'll be out of contact from a commanding and from a receiving point of view for a few days. But that's okay. Some of the initial data has been critical, uh, come down, the things that they really want to be able to get first up. We have 20 months to download all the data from the spacecraft. So this is very much along similar lines to what happened with the Pluto flyby, where the spacecraft needs to focus its attention on the target, and then when it's done that, it changes its orientation towards Earth, and then slowly starts to drip feed that information, both because of the power on the spacecraft and also because of the distance. Yes, the information coming back from New Horizons is literally, as you say, trickling down at anywhere between half to one kilometer kilobyte per second. So it actually takes an enormous amount of time to be able to get each file back from the spacecraft and the accumulated time over all the tracking opportunities we'll have with New Horizons over the next 20 months or so will take that long to get back the maybe accumulated as much as 50 gigabytes of data. I guess the exciting thing about this is that at this stage from what we have it appears that the spacecraft was oriented correctly to focus on the target. Yes really I think the, the mission team has got to be really really proud of the role that they uh, had there with their targeting, with their the mass behind it, to be able to precisely position their spacecraft to be able to do this flyby. It's quite remarkable for an object that they really didn't know exactly where it was located in space. There was sort of a general knowledge of its position, but to know precisely exactly where to point their cameras to be able to target as they were getting closer and closer using optical navigation images to be able to just tweak the trajectory enough to get that sweet spot 3,500 kilometres away from Ultima Thule so they could capture this data safely. That's Glenn Nagel from NASA's Deep Space Communications Complex near Canberra. New Horizons was launched on January the 19th, 2006 from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida aboard an Atlas V rocket. The probe then made history on the 14th of July 2015 when it became the first spacecraft to visit Pluto, flying just 12,500 kilometres above the 2,377 kilometre wide dwarf planet's surface. The spacecraft also studied Pluto's binary partner Sharon and their four moons, Styx, Nix, Kerberos and Hydra. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary. Astronomers claim a nearby galaxy hurtling towards the Milky Way on a collision course could fling our solar system into intergalactic space. The new research, reported in the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, predicts that the Large Magellanic Cloud, a satellite dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way, could hit our galaxy in around 2 billion years' time. The collision will occur much earlier than the predicted impact between the Milky Way and another neighbouring galaxy, Andromeda, which scientists say will cannibalise our galaxy in around 3.7 billion years from now. The catastrophic coming together with the Large Magellanic Cloud could wake up our galaxy's supermassive black hole, known as Sagittarius A star, a 4.3 million solar mass monster currently lying dormant at the very heart of our galaxy. This monster would then begin devouring surrounding stars and gas, increasing in size by around 10 times. As it feeds, the now active supermassive black hole would fling out high-energy radiation in powerful jets known as quasars. And while these cosmic fireworks are unlikely to affect life here on Earth some 27,000 light years away, scientists say there is a small chance that the initial collision could fling our solar system into intergalactic space. Galaxies like the Milky Way are surrounded by smaller satellite galaxies that orbit around them. Typically, these satellite galaxies have a quiet life, circling around their hosts for billions of years. However, from time to time, these satellites get a bit too close, and when they do, gravitational tidal forces start to draw stars and gas from the smaller galaxies into the larger, more dominant central galaxy. And in fact, that's happening right now, with gravitational tidal stellar streams flowing from the Large Magellanic Cloud into the Milky Way. Eventually, the entire galaxy could be cannibalised and devoured by its more massive neighbour. The Large Magellanic Cloud is only a tenth the mass of the Milky Way, 
It's the brightest satellite galaxy known to be orbiting the Milky Way and only entered our galactic neighbourhood about one and a half billion years ago. At the moment, it's about 163,000 light years away, but getting a little bit closer every day. Until very recently, astronomers thought that it would either orbit the Milky Way for many billions of years, or since it's moving so fast, might even escape the Milky Way's gravitational pull. However, new measurements indicate the Large Magellanic Cloud has nearly twice the amount of dark matter than previously thought. The authors say that since it has a larger than expected mass, the Large Magellanic Cloud is rapidly losing energy and is therefore doomed to collide with our galaxy. The study's lead author, Marius Corton from Durham University, says simulations carried out using the Eagle Galaxy Formation Supercomputer are predicting a collision. He says while 2 billion years is an extremely long time compared to a human lifespan, it's a relatively short time on cosmic scales. A galactic merger involving the Milky Way may be long overdue in cosmic terms. See, researchers think that up until now, our galaxies only had a few mergers with some very low-mass galaxies, such as the one currently going on on the other side of the Milky Way involving the Sagittarius Dwarf Galaxy. But these are so small, they represent fairly slim pickings compared to nearby galaxies the same size as the Milky Way. For example, our nearest biggest galactic neighbour, the Andromeda Galaxy M31, has devoured galaxies weighing nearly 30 times more than those consumed by the Milky Way. Therefore, a collision with a large Magellanic cloud would appear, at least on cosmic timescales, to be well overdue for our home galaxy. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. China has become the first nation on Earth to land a spacecraft on the far side of the moon. The Chung'e 4 touched down inside the 180km wide Von Karman crater, located inside the vast lunar south pole Aiken Basin region, at 177.6 degrees lunar east longitude and 45.5 degrees lunar south latitude. The 2,500-kilometre-wide, 13-kilometre-deep Aiken Basin is the largest known impact crater in the solar system. The landing, designed to heighten Beijing's scientific prowess, will allow scientists to obtain new insights into the history and formation of the basin and the moon as a whole. The moon is tidally locked to the Earth, with the same side always facing the Earth. And there's a great difference in the composition, terrain, structure and age of rocks between the lunar near and far sides. The far side, which by the way is never called the dark side by serious scientific aficionados, is very mountainous, rugged and thickly dotted with impact craters, giving it a very different appearance from the large flat mare covered near side. In fact, about 60% of the near side is covered with mare basalt, and of the 22 lunar mare, 19 are located on the near side. In contrast to the near side's mare basalts, the far side of the moon is covered by lunar highland and northosite. Scientists don't really understand the reasons for this geological asymmetry. About all they can infer is that the lunar crust must be thicker on the far side than the near side. But as to why that would be the case, well that's still a mystery. Because it always faces away from the Earth, the lunar far side is difficult to study in detail and landing on the far side places any probe out of radio contact with mission managers back on Earth. China's solution involved first placing a communications satellite named Magpie Bridge into a gravitationally stable position in space known as the Lunar Lagrange 2 position, some 65,000 kilometres above the lunar far side surface, from where it can relay communications between Earth and any far side lunar lander. This was then followed by the launch of the Chung'e 4 lander on December the 7th from the Xiaichang Satellite Launch Center in southwestern China's Sichuan province aboard a Long March 3B rocket. Named after Chung'e, the moon goddess in Chinese mythology, Chung'e 4 was originally built as a backup for the 1,200 kilogram Chung'e 3 lander, which touched down on the Bay of Rainbows on the lunar near side back on December the 14th, 2013. And just like Chung'e 3, the Chung'e 4 lander also carries a small 140kg six-wheeled rover known as U-2 or Jade Rabbit, which will explore the surrounding landscape. The U-2-2 rover was deployed onto the lunar surface 12 hours after touchdown. 
The mission will measure far side lunar surface temperatures, analyze the chemical composition of the far side rocks and soil regolith, study the local effects of cosmic rays, observe the solar corona, and even undertake some preliminary low frequency radio astronomy research. Other experiments include a biosphere project containing silkworm eggs, thalcress and tomato seeds as part of a project to investigate the moon's potential to support a future lunar base, part of long-term plans by Beijing to eventually mine the moon for helium-3. I'm Stuart Gary. This is Space Time. SpaceX's final launch for 2018 has placed the first of a new more advanced generation of GPS navigation satellites into orbit. The GPS-3 SV-01 was flown aboard a Falcon 9 rocket off Space Launch Complex 40 from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station in Florida. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition, lift off. And here we go. We've had a successful liftoff of the Falcon 9 vehicle carrying the GPS-3 space vehicle into transfer orbit. We're a little bit less than a, than a minute into our launch, and we're preparing for that point of maximum aerodynamic pressure known as maximum Q. Vehicle is supersonic. These are the strongest loads the vehicle experiences during liftoff. At this point now, it's just an easy acceleration up into our desired transfer orbit. All is looking good. Experiencing maximum aerodynamic pressure. Now we'll have a very busy next 90 seconds. We have three events coming up. Main engine cutoff, stage separation, and second engine start number one. That first event, main engine cutoff, or MECO, is where all of the nine Merlin 1D engines on our Falcon 9 first stage are going to shut down. This is then followed by stage separation, or the separation of our first and second stages. And finally, the second engine start, where our MVAC, our Merlin vacuum MVAC engine, initial. on the second stage engine lights up. You just heard now, we're starting to pump cold liquid oxygen through the plumbing of the MVAC engine to prepare it for ignition, just like we did with the Merlin 1D engines before liftoff. And just a reminder, we're not going to be recovering that first stage. MECO. Stage separation confirmed. Ignition. All right, this is great. We've had a successful MECO, stage separation, and SES-1. Our next immediate milestone is the Safe fairing deployment. We're going to expose the GPS-3 satellite to the vacuum of space. Fairing separation confirmed. The two fairing halves have separated and fallen away from the vehicle, exposing the GPS satellite to space. Everything is running nominally from the second stage to our payload. Relight of the second stage engine. Now, this is a very short burn, lasting uh, just about 45 seconds. That's because the MVAC is still producing just as much thrust as it was before, but it's significantly lighter now because we've consumed so much propellant on the way up. MVAC shutdown. And there's confirmation of MVAC shutdown. That's uh, second engine cutoff number two. And we're just gonna wait for confirmation of a good orbital insertion. Spacecraft separation confirmed. And there it is, a successful spacecraft separation. It was a case of fifth time lucky, with the launch being repeatedly delayed by issues involving the Falcon 9's first stage on two consecutive launch attempts, followed by a further two scrubs due to bad weather and high-altitude winds. The GPS-3 SV-01 had originally been slated to fly on a United Launch Alliance Delta IV back in September, with SpaceX to later fly the second in the series, the GPS-3 SV-02. However, the U.S. Air Force decided to swap launch vehicles. The Falcon 9 was flown in an expendable configuration, with no landing legs, no grid fins, and using all of its fuel in order to get the 3,880kg satellite into medium Earth orbit. The Lockheed Martin-built GPS-3 SV-01 was deployed into a 1,200km high orbit an hour and 56 minutes after launch. Over the next few days, the spacecraft used its own onboard liquid-fueled Apogee engines to place itself into its final 20,200-kilometer-high orbit. It will eventually be joined by nine additional third-generation Global Positioning System satellites, bolstering the 31-satellite navigation constellation. This mission marked a record 21st and final launch for 2018 for the Hawthorne, California-based company. As for 2019, well, it will see SpaceX launch an Israeli lunar lander, another test flight of its Falcon Heavy launch vehicle, this one for the US Air Force, 
and the first flights of its new Dragon 2 crew capsule, which will begin ferrying astronauts to the International Space Station. Meanwhile, SpaceX boss Elon Musk has tweeted that the company's new interplanetary spacecraft, the BFR, or Big Falcon Rocket, will have a new name. It's to be known as Starship. The BFR, now Starship, is a reusable launch vehicle being developed by SpaceX as a colonial transport vessel, carrying up to 100 passengers on journeys to the moon or Mars. The massive 118-metre-tall two-stage rocket will be capable of launching over 100 tonnes into low Earth orbit. It'll be powered by cryogenically cooled methane and liquid oxygen, or combination known as methalox, which will fuel its newly developed Raptor engines on both stages. The 63-metre-tall first stage, or booster stage, will be known as the Super Heavy. It'll be powered by 31 Raptor engines, providing more than 14 million pounds of thrust at launch. This Super Heavy first stage will be fully reusable, returning to Earth after each launch, landing back either on or near the very launch pad from where it lifted off. It'll then be checked out, refuelled and made ready for another flight, very much along the lines which airlines follow today. The upper stage, which is the actual Starship section, will be built in three configurations. There'll be a long-duration version capable of carrying passengers or cargo on interplanetary missions. A tanker version will carry propellant for Earth orbit refueling of spacecraft on interplanetary missions, and a satellite delivery version will be designed to deploy spacecraft into orbit. Once fully operational, the BFR or Starship launch system will replace the existing Falcon 9, Falcon Heavy and Dragon spacecraft. Meanwhile, plans by SpaceX to set up a new low-cost space-based high-speed internet service have been given the green light by US regulators. America's Federal Communications Commission has approved the plan to use an expanded range of wireless airwaves using a network of 12,000 satellites, blanketing the globe with wireless internet access. Three other companies, Kepler, Telsat and Leosa, have also been given FCC approval to launch similar constellations. The decision has, however, raised concerns about the likely problems posed by such a huge proliferation of space objects. And time now for a brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. A new study claims genetic alterations in low-risk prostate cancer diagnosed by needle biopsy can now identify patients that harbour higher-risk cancers in their prostate glands. The findings, reported in the journal Mayo Clinic Proceedings, have for the first time discovered genetic alterations associated with intermediate and high-risk prostate cancers can also be associated with some cases of low-risk prostate cancer. Researchers say the new findings mean that people diagnosed with low-risk cancers could benefit from additional testing for these new chromosomal alterations. Prostate cancer risk is assessed by Gleason patterns using a score that indicates severity. Gleason pattern 3 prostate cancer is considered to be at very low risk, while Gleason patterns 4 and 5 carry a higher risk of aggressive cancer behaviour. Men whose tumour is composed entirely of Gleason pattern 3 often choose active surveillance involving close monitoring using regular blood tests and needle biopsies. Or they may be referred for treatment such as surgery or radiation therapy. A new study warns that the melting of the Greenland ice sheet due to climate change is releasing tons of methane into the atmosphere. The new findings reported in the journal Nature shows that subglacial biological activity is impacting the atmosphere far more than previously thought. Although present in lower concentrations than carbon dioxide, methane is approximately 20 to 28 times more potent. Therefore, smaller quantities have the potential to cause disproportionately large impacts on atmospheric temperatures. Most of the Earth's methane is produced by microorganisms, and much of the remainder comes from fossil fuels like natural gas, although agriculture also plays a role. Most studies on Arctic methane sources have focused on permafrost. That's because these frozen soils tend to hold large reserves of organic carbon that could be converted to methane when they thaw due to global warming. While some methane has previously been detected in ice core samples from places like Greenland and Antarctica, this is the first time that meltwaters produced in spring and summer in large ice sheet catchments have been tested and found to continuously flush out methane from the ice sheet bed into the atmosphere. 
Apple has launched a new online tool that lets users download, change or delete all the data Apple's collected on them. The new tool was initially rolled out for users in the European Union in response to the EU's data protection laws. It's now available on the Apple privacy website for users in the US, Canada, Australia and New Zealand. And finally for now, a new study has shown that just like people, overweight dogs are more likely to have shorter lives than those at ideal body weights. The new findings reported in the Journal of Veterinary Internal Medicine are based on two decades of studies looking at more than 50,000 dogs across 12 of the most popular dog breeds. The study showed that the lifespan of overweight dogs was up to two and a half years shorter when compared to ideal weight dogs. The effect of being overweight was seen in all the breeds, although the magnitude of this effect differed somewhat, ranging from between five months less for male German Shepherds to two years and six months less for male Yorkshire Terriers. It's estimated that over a quarter of households in the UK and nearly half of all homes in the United States own a dog. You're listening to Space Time. I'm Stuart Gary, and that's the show for now. You can subscribe and download Space Time as a free twice-weekly podcast through Apple Podcast iTunes, Stitcher, Bytes.com, Pocket Casts, SoundCloud, YouTube, Audio Boom, from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com, or from your favorite podcast download provider. Space Time's also broadcast coast-to-coast across the United States on Science360 Radio by the National Science Foundation in Washington, D.C., and available around the world on TuneIn Radio. If you want more Space Time, check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as loads of images, news stories, videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word and in lowercase, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us on Twitter through at Stuart Gary, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, and on Facebook, just go to www.facebook.com slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 